Welcome, Kim 1 Honor students. This is our first video podcast. Remember the suggestions that we talked about in class, such as making sure that you're completing your fill in the blank notes sheet. Secondly, if you feel like you're running out of time, just push the pause button, hit the rewind button, listen to it again. And third, if you've got any questions, please make sure you write them down because you'll probably forget them by the time you come to class tomorrow. Here we have a definition of chemistry. And it says, the study of the composition, structure, and properties of matter, the processes that matter undergoes, and the energy changes that accompany these processes. So when we talk about composition, what is it made of? What type of atoms is it made of? Structure, how are those atoms arranged? And then based off of that arrangement and the type of atoms, what kind of properties does it possess? We're also going to be talking about some different processes like chemical and physical changes, as well as the energy changes that accompany them, endothermic, exothermic reactions. This is just a good overview of the different types of things we'll be studying this year. Branches of chemistry. Chemistry can be divided into different areas. Those areas include organic, inorganic, physical, analytical, biochemistry, and theoretical chemistry. So although it, chemistry is separated into these different areas, uh, they definitely do overlap. For example, if you're going to plan on being pre-med, you probably study biochemistry, but that does include analytical chemistry, checking blood sugars, blood levels. And you might also be studying organic and inorganic chemistry as well. So inorganic, what types of iron or phosphorus does the person have? So these areas overlap with each other. On this slide, we're talking about some definitions of research and technology. So we have basic research, and sometimes this is referred to as pure chemistry. Um, we're basically doing chemistry for the sake of knowledge, just because you think it's cool, you want to know. Applied research, we're solving a problem with this one, so we're applying the information we learned. And then sometimes we um, think of technology as kind of a separate science, but in fact technology is made to improve the quality of life or improve research. This slide provides us with some more basic definitions needed to study chemistry. So the building blocks of matter would be described as atom, elements, and compounds. And we're going to see the definition for compound on the next slide. So an atom is the smallest unit of an element that maintains the chemical identity of the element. And while you may know this, um, but atoms are described based off of their number of protons. And depending on the number of protons, this gives them different chemical identities or chemical properties. We were talking about that a second ago. An element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down into simpler, stable substances made of one type of atom. So all the atoms of an element have the same number of protons. And this makes sense because the number of protons determines the chemical identity or chemical properties of an element. So looking down here at these two um, pictures. We can see that we have a diamond down here. And diamonds just simply made up of carbon atoms that are in a that are in a what we call a crystal shape. Ooh, that was kind of a big arrow. Then over here we can see that we have a couple of molecules. And you notice each time you can see the little red molecule here. Each time these are representing oxygen atoms. So do in this one here water molecules you have one oxygen atom, and yet you've got two hydrogen. You can see that by the little tiny blue guys that are over here, okay? So H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen, and notice the subscript here, the little two that's under there, H2O, that tells you the number of hydrogens. On this one, it says O2, so that means that there's two oxygen atoms. And then this one I'm having a hard time seeing, but you can see there's lots of oxygen atoms. There's also some of those little blue hydrogens in there and some of the um, green here, and they're representing carbon. Now, an important thing to note is that if you were to actually be able to see an oxygen atom, they would not be red. It's just the way that the publisher here colors them or diagrams them. So it's just to keep in mind. And it's kind of a convention in chemistry that you use red for oxygen, blue for hydrogen.
Here we go. Compound, a substance that can be broken down into simple or stable or substances. And this is kind of a tricky, that sounded tricky to me. So it says each compound is made from the atoms of two or more elements. I love this. Two or more elements that are chemically bonded or bound to each other. So when we look here at aspirin, you can see that aspirin is made of three uh, different elements. We've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and that they're bound to each other. So hopefully you can see these little bonds here. You can see that it's indicating in the diagram that they're bound or chemically bound to each other. And notice the convention here. It says that we have four oxygens, okay, four oxygens. So I'm counting one, two, three, four oxygens here. And it says eight hydrogens, so we could count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens there. And if I counted all the green ones, it would tell me there'd be nine green ones there. So I'm hoping you're seeing how we write a chemical formula. We use the symbol for each element followed by a subscript that indicates the number of atoms in each compound. Rewind that if you need to hear it again. Pure substances. Pure substances are basically just one particular type of matter. So this could be a compound or an element. They're both known as pure substances. The idea here is that a pure substance um, in compounds, for example, water is always written oops, as H2O. Okay. Um, sodium chloride or salt is always written as NaCl. So they have like constant compositions, and so that's why we call it a pure substance. Gold, for example, is like a U. It's always made of the same type of atoms. This is always made of the same type of atoms in a constant ratio. Same type of atoms in a constant ratio. When we talk about matter, we talk about the properties that matter has. So we divide these properties into extensive and intensive, which you'll see on the next slide. So an extensive depends on the amount of matter present. It's the external, you guys, you see extensive external amount that is gives you that property. So that could be volume, mass, and amount of energy. And this makes sense because if I gave you, I don't know, one gram of sugar, it's gonna have a specific volume. But if I gave you two grams, which this means it's a different amount, then it's gonna have a different volume associated with it. So these are external dependent properties. The next type are intensive properties and they do not depend on the amount of matter present. So this is melting point, boiling point, density, electrical conductivity. So if I gave you that one gram of sugar and then I gave you two grams of sugar, they're both gonna melt, go from the solid to the liquid phase at the same temperature. The temperature doesn't matter if it's one gram or two grams, it's going to have the same, we abbreviate a lot in chemistry, same melting point, MP. Physical properties as opposed to chemical properties, which we'll see on the next slide. So physical properties can be observed or measured without changing the identity of the substance. So density, color, and melting point are all physical properties, and I'm sure you can look on the web or in your textbook for some other physical properties for your notes. On the other hand, a chemical property relates to the substance's ability to undergo change that transforms it into a new substance. So flammability, reactivity, and toxicity. So if I burn a piece of paper, it's gonna turn into a pile of ashes. So it's definitely turned into something different, okay? Or a piece of wood, it's gonna turn into charcoal. It's definitely something new at that point. So it's ability to undergo change that transform it into a different, different substance. Physical change, if it's still the same substance when you're done with it, it's only a physical change. So crushing, tearing, evaporating water in any phase change. This is the one that always seems to kind of keep people, uh, hang people up. So any phase change. So if I have ice cube and it melts into water, it's only considered a physical change because it's still, going back to our formula H2O, and it's still H2O. 
it's just in the solid phase here and in the liquid phase here. So it's the same chemical formula. Chemical changes, if it's not the same substance when you're done with it, it's a chemical change. So cooking, burning something, rusting of metal, it's not the same. Again, going back to our example, here's my piece of wood. I burn it, and now I've got some charcoal. Uh, it also goes CO2 up into the air, into the gas form. So it kind of turns into different things than it was originally. So how do you know if it's a chemical or a physical change? Well, there's about eight different ways that are identifiers that will help you determine this. So if you see any bubbling, that means gas is escaping, a color change, and a temperature change. This means it's releasing or absorbing energy. So these are some clues. A few other indicators also include, does it produce light? Does it form a precipitate at the bottom and that's a solid? when it was from two liquids and is there heat produced? You can see how heat and temperature kind of go along. Like, is it getting hotter? Is it getting cooler? So finally, you want to ask yourself, has the substance been changed? Has is it gone from one type of substance to a new type of substance? And so if you answer this question with a yes, it's undergone a chemical change. Remember those clues that can kind of help you know if it's a new substance. And if you said no, it's just considered a physical change. And we're going to do, be doing some practice during our lab. So energy. Energy is always either used up or given off in any physical or chemical change. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. And that goes with the law of conservation of energy. So if we're conserving something, we're keeping it the same. We're not making more. We're not getting rid of it. We're conserving it. Here we go. Something you've probably seen a billion times. States of matter. A solid has a definite shape and a definite volume. This is what I would consider a molecular diagram here. You can see all the little dots here. These are kind of like all the atoms are represented here. So on your paper, that's what you're going to want to draw. And our example is ice. Liquid has an indefinite shape, but a definite volume. It takes the shape of the container. Again, here's the molecular diagram for liquid. Notice that they are still on the bottom of the jar, but they're not as closely compact or squished together or neatly organized as solid was. And again, here we have our example, liquid water. Gas. Gas has no definite shape or volume. So it expands to fill the container. So remember for liquids a second ago I said, oh, it was all on the bottom. But now it's up all the way to the top. And now here you can see the bubbles escaping here. So that's what would be considered our gas. Here's our bubbles. Our fourth state of matter that I honestly don't talk about in regular chem is considered plasma. Plasma has no definite shape or volume. It's at a high temperature where the atoms lose most of their electrons. They're kind of um, changing some of their properties. So sun and other stars are made of plasma. We actually have it in our lights. Um, the aurora borealis, it's kind of like the northern lights that you see like maybe over Alaska. And then lightning is also made of plasma. Changes the state video. Ooh, it's going to be a video like it. Okay, 